Hi, and welcome to the video for the E2 reaction. E is for elimination, and the 2 means a bimolecular rate determining step. The rate of the reaction depends on both the concentration of the electrophile and the concentration of the base. The first thing we are going to do is look at the mechanism for the reaction. Here we have an alkyl halide, and this entire molecule is known as the electrophile. Because the electrophile is electron loving, it is electron deficient, and so it is seeking electrons. We can tell that because the leaving group, the bromide, is delta negative, and the alpha carbon is delta positive. Now I draw in the proton on the beta carbon. The reaction occurs in the presence of a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide, which will look more like Na plus and OH minus. The hydroxide will react in a single step with the electrophile to give an alkene product, and this is where the bimolecular rate determining step comes into play. Because hydroxide is a strong base, it is not going to wait for that bromine to leave like we saw in the E1 reaction. Instead, when it collides with the proton on the beta carbon, the base has sufficient energy to force the carbon-hydrogen bond to break. The red electrons on that beta carbon flow toward the delta positive alpha carbon, and all at the same time, the leaving group is forced to leave. So a double bond has been created in the E2 mechanism, just like it happened in the E1 me mechanism. Only the mechanism is slightly different. Then of course, there are the other side products we have generated. Water from the deprotonation step, the bromide leaving group, and there's still the sodium cation, which was a spectator ion for the reaction. I put those in brackets because the major concern is the major organic product. In summary, there was an electrophile and a strong base. The strong base deprotonated on the beta carbon. The CH electrons flow toward the delta plus alpha carbon, and the alpha carbon bromine bond broke. The electronegative bromine took the electrons. That left a double bond on the organic portion between alpha and beta carbons. Water was formed, and the bromine leaving group formed. The sodium, Na+, remained as a spectator ion. Here is a summary of key elements for this E2 reaction. The alpha carbon for the reaction can be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Notice the difference between that and the E1 reaction, where really the reaction would not work with primary unless it was resonance stabilized. It worked variably with secondary alpha carbons and best with tertiary alpha carbons. For E2, the leaving group needs to be good, just like with the E1 and SN1 reactions, also with SN2 once we get there. Remember that a good leaving group is also a weak base. The base for an E2 reaction needs to be strong, and we are going to look at what, at what that means in a couple of minutes. The size of the base affects the regiochemical outcome of the reaction. We'll see that in a bit as well. Polar, aprotic solvents work best, but the reaction can proceed in polar, protic solvents as well. In terms of stereochemistry, the proton and the leaving group must be anti-periplanar. We will discuss that requirement in depth in class. For the regiochemistry of the reaction, that's the location of the reaction, in this case we're referring to the location of the final double bond. Provided that the stereochemical requirements are met, small, strong bases lead to the most substituted alkene, known as a Zaitsev product. Bulky, strong bases lead to the least substituted alkene, known as the Hoffman product. The next thing to consider is the type of base that's used. The major thing to remember here is that a strong base is needed for an E2 reaction, not a weak base like we saw in the E1. What's considered to be strong enough? In this case, we are looking for a pKaH, pKa of the conjugate acid, greater than 10, approximately. Sodium hydroxide is a standard example of a strong base for an E2 reaction. Remember when you see a metal, nonmetal, you can dissociate that into its composite ions. We are focusing on the hydroxide. Hydroxide has a pKaH, meaning the pKa of water, of 15.7. That's greater than 10, so therefore the base, hydroxide, is a strong enough base for an E2 reaction. Similar to hydroxide, other good strong bases in this category are OR-, which might be methoxide, ethoxide, essentially an oxygen anion with alkyl groups bound to it. An amine can also be strong enough base for the reaction. So an example here might be triethylamine, 
which has a pKa H of about 11. Now I mentioned earlier that the size of the base is important in terms of the regiochemical outcome of the reaction. Small, strong bases are ones that are not very sterically hindered. An example would be hydroxide with just a little proton next to the basic atom, hydride, which is a classic strong base that never acts as a nucleophile. They have pKa H's of 15.7 and 35, respectively. One example of a bulky strong base is DBU, and I'll draw it out here for you to see the structure. That will show us why it's bulky. Notice that the most basic atom has lots of substituents around it. There's a tertiary amine, a secondary amine, and other branching nearby. It has a pKa H of about 12. Hunig's base, diisopropyl ethylamine, is also very sterically hindered. Notice all the branching around the basic nitrogen atom. It has a pKa H of about 11. Both these bases are strong enough to work in the E2 reaction. For the size of the base to affect the outcome of the reaction, stereochemical requirements first have to be met. In this case, the hydrogen being removed and the leaving group have to be anti-peri planar. We can see that best in a Newman projection. If I imagine my eyes looking down that center carbon-carbon bond, I put the leftmost carbon at the front, the right-hand carbon, the alpha carbon with the leaving group at the back, and I draw the Newman projection of that. So the H and the leaving group have to be anti, which means opposite to each other, and they need to be periplanar, meaning in the same plane, and that's what we can see from the Newman projection. Now provided that those stereochemical requirements have been met, small strong bases lead to the formation of the most substituted alkene as the major product. This is known as the Zaitsev product. Bulky strong bases lead to the least substituted alkene as the major product, known as the Hoffman product. For example, if we use the same substrate in both cases, but in the first example we use a small strong base such as sodium hydride, the active part of the base is the hydride. Or we can use DBU. These will give different products. The small strong base will extract a proton on the more substituted beta carbon. Electrons flow to form a double bond between alpha and beta, the leaving group leaves, leading to the disubstituted alkene. In the other case, this large bulky base, DBU, removes a proton from the least substituted beta carbon. It removes the most accessible proton to it because it's so large and bulky it requires more energy to get to that molecule. So small strong bases give the most substituted alkene, bulky strong bases give the least substituted alkene. As long as the stereochemical requirements of the H and the leaving group being antiperiplanar have been met. In this video, we saw the mechanism of the E2 reaction, the factors that favor an E2 reaction, the stereochemical requirements of the reaction, and the regiochemical outcomes of the reaction.